the third lecture. I'll just make an announcement that the PPTs, this presentation files will be available with me. My email address is Datta, D-U-T-T-A. Whoever wants a copy, please write a mail to me. I will send it but with his the, permission. Give the PDF version. Ah, of course, I will give the PDF version. So, welcome and I am thankful to you for your generosity of spending the evening, valuable evenings with me in this room. Uh, only two more days of suffering, not much longer. So today, uh, uh, as I mentioned that the subject is really very vast and I am trying to present only the very essence of it. Because if I want to start discussing the calculation procedure, not only that, some of you will not be interested in that. There is no time for it. Many other things which I would like to discuss will not be possible. So therefore, I have advised that the books are there. I have been told that already a full set of the 11 volumes of the series has been purchased and it is in the new arrival. And I have also given a copy uh, separately. So I think those of you who are interested in the details of calculation, uh, so you can see that. So today uh, we will start our discussion on Siddhantic Astronomy. And uh, after Vedanga Jatis, I mentioned this, that there was a long dark period characterized by the absence of any major and important uh, development or text on the subject. And as it happened during this period, the outside uh, disturbances started coming. Uh, the rise of Buddhism where astronomy is not or astrology is not uh, preferred so astronomy didn't or it lost its primary impetus and all these things were there that is in general you will find that even uh, after the uh, I think 14th or 15th century BC there is not much known about it it is a dark period so, but one thing is found that even in the Mahabharata's time, which is around 15-1600 BC approximately, the concept of 12 Rasis emerged, though of course separate names were not given. But the planets were all known, their motions were all analyzed qualitatively. That means, you know, whenever they are having a retrograde motion, it is found that, you know, Mangal is in Bakri and so on. During this period, another thing happened, which I will take up in the last lecture, which is very interesting. Astrology is not scientifically very uh, important, at least personally to me. But I think in the past, astrological references sometimes become very useful. One such thing is exaltation of Mars. Exaltation means when a particular planet is very bright. The stars don't change their brightness, but the planets do, depending on the distance from the Earth. Now, Mars or Mangal, when it is in its uh, perihelion position, it is nearest to Sun. And when Earth is in aphelion position, it is farthest from the Sun. When these two positions are side by side, the distance between Earth and Mars is the minimum. And the brightness of that planet is very very large, that's almost three to four times more than what is normally we find. And that's why the astrologers call Mangal Ucha or exaltation of Mars. Now, the importance of this is that if, and they also say that Mangal is in Ucha against this nakshatra, that nakshatras are our reference point. The moment they say that, you know that that was a situation where if you draw a line from Earth to Mars, it will go to that that particular nakshatra and Mangal or Mars is in perihelion position and Earth is in aphelion position. So you can calculate when it happened. So one scientist who is no more, Professor Rana, he was in Ayuka. You know, so, so he also wrote some books. He has done a lot of research on that and said that such astrological references are found which are around uh, 11 or 1200 uh, BC. So during that period, the astrology, etc., in a fragmented form we get, and we can use them for the chronological ordering of events. Then, so this 60 year Jupiter or Mercury's uh, uh, Venus uh, time period. We are not Venus, Jupiter. 
No, this is Jupiter, but you said about Venus yesterday. Time period of Venus, you mentioned. Oh, that it. was, yeah. That yesterday. Was, yeah. So, this is purely from the geocentric point of view. Of when course. It comes back in the same yeah, constellation. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Now, with these periods are all sidereal periods. In case of planets, they are generally sidereal periods. That means against a particular star. And uh, uh, as, you, as I mentioned that Vedanga period, the motion of planets were qualitatively studied and uh, the Jupiter period was approximately 12 years. So they also developed a, a Juga system with a 5 year Juga system with a 60 year Jupiter cycle. You know. That was also devised, but they are not very relevant and not neither. Uh, it doesn't have much impact. At that time, Jaina astronomy flourished. There are lots of texts, you know, the names are somewhat uh, difficult to pronounce, like Surya Pragnapati, Jyotisha Parandaka, then Chandra Pragnapati, Jambudipa Pragnapati, like that. And Jaina cosmology, etc., you know, they all developed, you know, those of you who have interest, you can go through that. But to normally it is not considered very important from the point of view of astronomy. And at the same time, as I mentioned, that with rise of Buddhism, the astrology lost its importance and so the main impetus for doing astronomy also was gone. So in very fragmented form things are going almost for thousand years. In the, uh, uh, the study of comets motion as I mentioned yesterday was there and many comets were found to be periodic in nature and the periods were found out and many astronomers names were associated with those comets. and. Uh, like say, for example, uh, uh, some of the comets uh, had period which one astronomer could identify or analyze during his lifetime and so they were named after those astronomers. So <coughs> this requires definitely very accurate observation and prolonged observation. So the observation of many European scholars that Indian, ancient Indians were not uh, having the capability to observe, etc., is absolutely not tenable. And uh, as I mentioned, that North India was being disturbed very much, so uh, astronomy stopped because astronomy requires a peaceful environment where a person can observe day after day the positions, etc., accurately year after year. So this kind of situation did not. But at the same time, what happened with the uh, coming of Alexander and later his uh, other persons like Seleucus and uh, other Greeks like Megasthenes, Arian. So exchange of ideas started taking place also. So many ideas of Hellenistic astronomy we find in Indian astronomy, but they have, it has been found that it was not a copy because the things were only a very basic similarity, but otherwise in details they are very different, which we will discuss in a separate point, a section of discussion about the originality of Indian astronomy. That will be in the last lecture, antiquity. Using astronomy, we will find out the dates when these kinds of things were there, and we will also discuss the uh, points about the originality, which parts are original, why it is considered original, and so on. That will be later. And uh, uh, now I think what first thing we notice in the, the Siddhantic astronomy was matured in the 4th century, 5th century AD and the first major famous astronomer of the Siddhantic period was Aryabhatta I. There are two Aryabhattas, you know, so to distinguish that one is called, the earlier one who is more famous is Aryabhatta I. Much later there was another Aryabhatta, Aryabhatta II. So we find the first uh, occurrence of weekdays and the names of the zodiacal signs. You, surprisingly, the names of the weekdays and names of the zodiacal signs were very similar to that of those found in Hellenistic astronomy. In the Vedic era, as I mentioned yesterday, that there was a shadaha kind of thing. That means a week of six days. And uh, the emergence of seven day week system happened during the transition between Vedanga and Siddhantic astronomy. It is believed that the Chaldeans, they started the seven day week system. What happened, you know, uh, the, what, you can easily guess why seven day, because seven planets are there. 
Sun, Moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. So, uh, so they, each planet was associated with a god. And uh, the seven days which we had system based on these seven planets and seven gods, I will tell you how it happened. And they linked uh, each planet with a, uh, with a planet god and the system was like this. In their system, they found that every day was divided into 24 hours. The, every hour was ruled by one planet god in series. And the planets were placed in order in the ancient uh, idea about the distance from the earth. So you can see this is earth, nearest is moon, next is mercury, next is Venus, then is sun, then Mars, Jupiter and Saturn. That was the perceived distance from earth in the ancient astronomy. Now I think every, if you start here, so for example, the first hour is ruled by Saturn. So that particular day out of the 24 <coughs> hours. So Venus would be closer to the earth. No, no, ancient astronomy was like this, you know. Yeah. It is not the heliocentric model, you know, this geocentric model and that was their perceived uh, way of doing it. You know. So uh, Venus is closer to the Earth than Mercury, no? Mercury is the first. Yeah, but I think uh, the, the uh, Moon, then Mercury, then Venus, that was the way they were doing in those days. I think so, unless I made some mistake, I see that. But I think basic idea is like this, that whichever planet God rules the first hour, the day is named after that. So you can see, if you start your day with Saturn ruling the first hour, okay? Then next to is two is another planet. So you have to complete so two, three, four, up to this and up to 24 hours. Next day's first hour is ruled by Sun. So if you see that this is ruled by Saturn, then Jupiter, then Mars, then Sun, then Venus, then Mercury, then Moon, then uh, you go to uh, next to the, uh, again Saturn, again uh, Jupiter and so on, again Saturn, Jupiter and so on, again Saturn, Jupiter, Mars and the day is completed here, next day's first hour is ruled by Sun. So the day will be called Sunday, okay? So then you see again you go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, the day is over, 24 hours. So where the next day is, which planet rules? It is moon. Moon is shown, Monday. So that is the scheme by which we get the names of the days in a week. Is it clear? And even in Indian system, we are following the same Saturday is Shanibar, Sunday is Ravibar, Monday is Sombar, Som is moon, you know. Uh, next day you will find if you do, after 24 hours or 24 slots, then next day the first hour is going to be ruled by Mars. So it will be Mangal, Tuesday. So uh, this system, it is felt that it was developed by Chaldeans and uh, the Chaldeans, uh, the, their thing was, or the texts were translated into Greek. I think the person who did it is Berosas in the 6th century BC, uh, he translated these astronomical texts into Greek and the system got adopted in Greek astronomy. That when the Greeks came to India with that, this exchange of idea, this seven day week system came and the Siddhantic astronomers started following it. Sir, yeah. who were Chaldeans? Who were? Chaldean were like, you know, in the ancient civilization has many, like Babylonians, Chaldeans, all those people. You have to see that Middle East and near the Near East, bordering Europe, those places, Egypt. It will be somewhere near, I think, Syria. The Central Asia. Huh? The Central Asia. No, this is not Central Asia, definitely not. Syria is not in Central Asia. 
Now, I think as I mentioned that why we call it Siddhantic test? Because Siddhanta means final decision and each astronomer, when he wrote something, he thought that is the final, uh, final decision or final astronomical text. So they used to give the name Siddhanta. Everyone used to call Siddhanta after his name, as you will see very soon. Another feature you will find that uh, the 12 zodiacal signs, those names also were originally given by the, uh, by the Greek people following the Chaldean calendar and, and that also got transmitted to Indian Siddhantic astronomy. We started following Rashi's. At the same time, people started following Nakshatra. So it was a mixture of solar, because Rasi means uh, sun takes that position and then 12 times you divide the ecliptic, so each part is one Rasi. Sun takes and spends their time every month, solar month. So this mixture, but we are also using uh, Tithis, Nakshatras, etc. So it continued to be a mixture. Even I think you will find later I will come to that, not now, so they are not bothering on that. So you see, uh, the Babylonian first divided the ecliptic into 12 divisions and uh, they gave the names of the Rashis as bull, ram and all kinds of things, scorpion, that got translated and that also came to India. So that is the general belief that the Weekday system was first started by Chaldeans and the Rashi and uh, 12 uh, zodiacal signs, their names were given by the Babylonians. And all those things came to India via the Greek. Now there is uh, an interesting point we have to mention here. The one basic tenet of Siddhantic period astronomy was to avoid, you know, what they did, you know, to avoid the occurrence of fractional numbers, they considered a period when all the planets will make integer number of revolutions. That means it is a kind of LCM kind of thing you can see. And so therefore, the Juga system which they developed is a much, much longer period than what Juga system they developed in astronomers in the Vedic period. So you will find, and it was a unique method, uh, which will involve very long periods, uh, yugas, mahajugas, kalpas, manus, etc. So therefore, uh, this was a mathematical requirement, you know, with LCM thing. Sometimes, therefore, I personally believe by mistakenly we think that really our history goes back like that, that uh, millions of years in the past, a mahajuga, kalpa. I'm not so sure that if uh, that really happened, or on the other hand, it was a mathematical requirement uh, by the astronomers to avoid fractional numbers. You will see more details, we will come to that. Now, is this point clear? This is a very confusing thing in our uh, history that we, when you say Mahajuga, they think actually our history also goes to Mahajuga. But it may not be so. It could be a mathematical requirement. Now, this Siddhanta text, uh, text, you know, they are quite massive things and uh, they describe many things, the system of the universe, the calculation and other kinds of things like determination of eclipse, uh, all these things were there. And these Siddhantas also used to be so big that uh, many times uh, the, the the authors of the Siddhantas created a smaller version, what we call these days Medici kind of thing, you know, which will be quickly used for calculating things. They used to be called as Karanas. They are nothing but uh, simple, ex simple text which will be used only for calculating your or preparing the Panchangas or the calendar. So these Karana texts were prepared primarily to give ready-made algorithms and used more convenient contemporary dates of the epoch. It means, I will come to that when I discuss what is epoch and what is era. So the post Vedanga Jyotish astronomy in India it can be divided into periods as indicated in the table. The first period we call early Siddhantic period. 
which started around 100 BC, which is not very clearly known, and continued up to 4th century AD. Then Siddhanta period, when we first find Aryabhatta 1, can be put in this range 400 AD to 1100 AD. Late Siddhantic period and medieval period, 1100 AD to 1800 AD. And after 1800 AD is called the modern period when telescopic astronomy was there. So this is the way it is divided. And this map shows ancient India and the places where the most important astronomers of Siddhantic period were born or worked because it is not known sometimes whether the fellow was born there or he worked there. And along with the approximate year of their birth or work, so you can see, uh, this is not very clear. Uh, this is the uh, Himalaya, which is old name was Himamanta, Maha Himamanta or Himamanta. That is the old Sanskrit name of Himalaya. And this Himamanta, the Greek people started saying it as Hemodos. And Hemodos uh, again got distorted into Hemodos. Even today, if you go to Italy, you will see a station where you have to get down to go to Vesuvius, and that is called Herculano. Actually, it is Herculaneum. So, it has changed to Herculano. It always happens. So, it is Hemodos or Himodos or Himavanta in the Himalaya. This is Tamnaparni. Tamnaparni was the old Sanskrit name of Lanka. That they, Greek used to call it Taproben. So like that. So here, important places where we have the most uh, distinguished astronomers of Siddhantic period. One is, you can recognize this part, Pataliputra or Kusumapura. Actually, Patali is a kind of flower, you know. And that's why quite often many uh, astronomers or many philosophers used to call Pataliputra also by the name Kusumapura. And it is known that the Aryabhatta worked at Kusumapura, which is Pataliputra, because Patali is a kind of flower after which the name was given. Maybe Pataliputra had a lot of flower gardens, somewhat different from today's Pataliputra. Then we have the place here with Jain. Actually, with Jain for a long time was our, like Greenwich, had the meridian zero. Then in Gujarat, where Brahmagupta worked and born, also very famous person. Then Bhaskar, yeah, Bhaskar. And this is I can read from here. Sripati. Ah, Sripati was there and Barahami worked, worked with Jain, you all know. He was one of the Navaratnas. Sripati was somewhere in Bidarva area. Then Bhaskara too was there in uh, Telangana, what we call today, or south south southern part of uh, uh, they call it uh, uh, Maratha water region. And of course, finally, Kerala. What happened, more and more disturbances came here and the, most of the academic pursuits gradually shifted uh, towards the south and ultimately accumulated here. So the, all the late stage Siddhantic, very famous astronomers, Nilkantha and others, you know, they were all uh, from Kerala. So uh, this is that will give. This is actually ancient India. This map has been drawn, uh, which is contemporary at 300 BC. But they were, of course, not 300 BC, but much later. But the names which have been given, they belong to 300 BC. So these are the uh, important astronomers of different periods. Early Siddhanta period, we have Sri Sena. Mayasura, Lata Deva, and I think uh, these are the people who were before Aryabhatta, and they did some work during the transition period. Then also it is told that Romaka Siddhanta is there, maybe, and then there is Kaushila Siddhanta is there. So they are all during the transition period. Then Aryabhatta one, 476 AD, he was in Patna, Bihar. Bara Mihir was the next 505 at Ujjain. 
भास्कर सिक्स हंड्रेड ए डी इन गुजरात ब्रह्मगुप्त फाइव नाइन्टी एट ए डी इन राजस्थान लल्ला एंड मलवा देन मलवा मीन्स माला विच इज नियर आई थिंक वॉट विल बी माला और इंदौर एंड दोज प्लेसेस वी कैन कॉल माला बट बटेश्वर एट एटी ए डी इन गुजरात मंजुला वॉज अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट वन प्रकाशपत्तम साउथ आर्यभट्ट टू नाइन फिफ्टी ए डी भास्कर टू इलेवन हंड्रेड फोर्टीन ए डी एंड इन दी लेट सिद्धांतिक पीरियड यू हैव श्रीपति इन मध्य प्रदेश परमेश्वर इन केरला एंड नीलकंठ सोम वेरी फेमस वन इन ऑल्सो केरला एंड मेडियल पीरियड सिद्धांतिक एस्ट्रोनॉमी वॉज डन मिक्स विथ जी एस्ट्रोनॉमी महाराजा स्वाइजन जय सिंह एंड द लास्ट इट इज नॉट कमिंग हियर द लास्ट सिद्धांतिक एस्ट्रोनॉमर वॉज फ्रॉम ओडिशा सामंत चंद्रशेखर एंड यू कैन सी देयर टेक्स्ट वशिष्ठ सिद्धांत पितामह सिद्धांत रोमक सिद्धांत सूर्य सिद्धांत एंड आर्यभट्ट स्टार्टेड विथ आर्यभट्टियम और आर्य सिद्धांत एंड बरामोही फाउंड ही स्टाडीड ऑल आई थिंक एट दैट टाइम जेर अबाउट ट्वेंटी सिक्स सिद्धांत ही फाउंड एंड फाउंड मोस्ट ऑफ देम आर इनएकुरेट ऑफ नॉट मच यूज एक्चुअली वॉट वॉज हैपनिंग वेदांग जतीस आफ्टर दैट ऑल दो स्टेक्स वेर इनएकुरेट वी हैव सीन दि वे वी कैलकुलेट वेरी अप्रॉक्सिमेट and they are not of much use so therefore they are not used and they are completely forgotten only vedanga which is remain because of that name vedanga it was treated as a part of religious text otherwise you know perhaps it would not have survived also and uh, then what he found only five of those siddhantas were of use and he wrote a text called pancha siddhantika varahu he Bahavi's main uh, uh, occupation was, of course, astrology. You know, so his work in astronomy was primarily compilation, not much fundamental work. Then, of course, uh, Bahavi, then uh, Bhaskar, then Brahma. This Brahma Gupta is considered to be one of the best, and his Siddhanta was Brahma Siddhanta or Brahma Sphuta Siddhanta, <coughs> both are same. And he had a Karana. Which was also very popular. That is Khanda Khanda. They are all translated into Arabic language, and that started the Zee astronomy there, you know, and so on. We will not go. The last <coughs> Siddhanta we have Siddhanta Darpana, that is written by Samanta Chandrasekhar. That is the last, and that is used even today. His calculations were so accurate. The Puri Temple, Jagannath Temple, all things are done according to Samanta Chandrasekhar's calculations. now how texts were arranged in siddhantik uh, the material was presented in four chapters generally in siddhantas the chapters in sanskrit are called adhikaras and first used to be madhyama adhikara so this used to give the method of calculation and data etc for mean positions you know in all astronomical texts whether in india or in greece the finding position is the main important objective of positional astronomy you know that finding out the position of sun or moon or a planet in vedanga jyotisha only sun and moon's position calculations were there planet calculation was not there in vedanga jyotisha but they were in siddhanta siddhanta the uh, position of the planets five planets and sun and moon all were included now the technique generally used to be like this first you find out the mean position how mean position is found out you take the average speed of rotation and you find out at a particular time where it is going to be that is the mean position not the real thing then you make corrections on that to get the exact true position they used to call i will come to that so madhyam adhikaras main purpose was to calculate the mean position of a planet or sun or moon and the detail the procedure for obtaining the true position of the and spostadhikara was the detailed procedure 
by applying the corrections which they call samskaras to get the real true correct position of the heavenly bodies and the i will come to that there are primarily two types of corrections one is manda corrections and there is shigra correction manda correction was for sun and moon and it took care of the non uniform speed of the heavenly bodies because you know being on elliptic orbit and the distance from the sun being different and according to kepler's uh, first law they will you know second law they will definitely have different speeds so therefore they don't move with a constant speed or mean speed so therefore you need to correct it so that was for sun and moon the shigra correction was important for planets of course for planets manda correction was also there but you had to also do shigra correction that used to take care of because you see real system is heliocentric but we are observing sitting on the earth as a geocentric system so that needed some some scars and they are called shigra samskara they are for the five planets not for sun and moon there was another third uh, chapter that is tri prashna adhikara this took up the three aspects of direction place time finding out latitudes of places times of sunrise sunset and the changes of position of sunrise etc that was the objective of tri prashna adhikara and last was chandra and surya grahana adhikara that presented the method for determining lunar and solar eclipses many mathematical aspects were also taken up actually mathematics also developed during this period because it involved calculation etc particularly trigonometry they developed during this period now there are four schools of siddhantic astronomy you know it, it happens yeah. so the greeks used to call it epicycles Did they have some word like epicycles for? Yeah, yeah. I say that not only that, as I will show you later, Indian epicycles were somewhat different. Greek epicycles were fixed size. Indian epicycles, the size used to vary, to, and that was more accurate description. Because anyway, epicycle is actually fantasy; it was not a reality. Mm -hmm. So, Indian epicycle system was more advanced. It took care of further uh, approximation by giving the variation in the epicycle. It was not like the Greek epicycle. So actually, as I mentioned, when I discuss the originality of Indian astronomy, all these points will come. That how much was taken directly and how much actually got developed indigenous. So the four schools or paksha they call were Brahma paksha, Arya paksha, Ardha Ratri ka paksha, and Saura paksha. And all the four schools retained the traditional concept of Mahajuga. but adapted units of time and epochs differently as you will see in vedanga jyotish you have seen that we had a five year yuga system primarily to achieve integer number of lunar months and solar years in a yuga that we have discussed yesterday in siddhantik astronomy a yuga meant a much longer period of time with an aim to express the revolutions of planets avoiding fractional numbers so you see that was the yuga system and epoch in uh, siddhantik astronomy now you can see that in the brahma paksha and surya paksha followed one set of data and your arya paksha ardha ratri ka paksha started another set of data so krita yuga was 17 lakhs 28000 years next treta yuga was 12000 uh, 12 lakhs 96000 years dwapara yuga was 8 lakh 64000 years kali yuga is supposed to be 4 lakh 32000 years so in total one maha yuga had 43 lakhs 20000 years in arya paksha and ardha ratri ka paksha system was they divided all yugas equally and they were of 10 lakhs 80000 years in total again one maha yuga was 43 lakhs 20000 years then 71 mahajugas made one mannantara or a monu and that was obviously multiplied by 71 and you get such a big number you know i don't want to read it 
in other system school they had uh, 72 Mahajuga made one man mantra or one manu and 14 manus make one kalpa. So you can see in this school one, uh, one kalpa is so many years which is considered Brahma as one day and 1008 <coughs> Mahajugas. Now here you find that we have got ultimately the same number you will find but they added some sandha period. One juga, maha juga to another maha juga, they used to add one intercalary juga or they used to call it sandha period, evening period. So maybe Kuomintan dusk, isn't it? Something like that. From one revolution, you are going to a revolutionary period and it is never an abrupt change, there will be always a Kuomintan dusk or prak vipla rakta gozuli in Bengali or Sanskrit where a lot of killing, etc. goes on. So, you see, that is the way they got a huge number, one kalpa is this much in this poksha, this school, and here it was this, one kalpa is this much, somewhat different. Sandha period concept is absent here, and one kalpa is 1008 Mahajuga. Here, there is a Sandha period, each being equal to a Krita Juga, between two successive manantaras as the time required for each creation. Thus, one kalpa is equal to thousand mahajugas in this case. So, this is the kind of thing, but point is to, I am not so sure, I will leave it to you to judge that whether this is really our history goes like that or it is a mathematical requirement to avoid or taking a large period so that you express all the uh, all the numbers in integer forms like LCM. So I personally believe it was a mathematical requirement, you know. Not that, uh, but I think since everything you have to do, if you put everything in purely mathematical form, people don't like it. So you give it a kind of reality by giving these things. That Brahma is there, he is one day, is one kalpa, etc. All kinds of things. Interestingly, this 4 billion years hmm. is interesting because we now we know 15 billion years is the age of the present time. And that is the danger. Immediately people will say, oh, we all knew about Big Bang and so on. So that creates some, I think, such coincidence, uh, it is not, but I think it, you have seen, perhaps, you know, uh, I feel it is primarily mathematical requirement to express the revolutions in integer numbers. Just like a five years ago, a simple case where the solar revolution and lunar revolutions all both were integer numbers. You know. It is 71 and what was that? 71, 72, 14? They followed different. They are all calculations. That's what I'm saying. That, you know, they found they calculated that way. Ultimately, their objective was to find out the position of a planet on a particular day and time. That's all. Nothing else. So, the use of Mahajuga system, the number or number of revolutions in one Mahajuga, say the sun revolves so many times, stars revolve so many times. Now, stars revolution is nothing but revolution of the earth, isn't it? Earth's rotation is the star's rotation. So, then uh, Savana days is this much, the moon, Savana days will be little less because you have seen one savana take, takes a little bit more time, as I told. When you are here seeing the sunrise, coming back to the same position, next sunrise you don't find you have to go a little bit more because sun has gone a little bit high because of the orbital motion. So that's why savana day numbers are little less than the rotation of the earth. The moon rotates so many times, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, then civil months, lunar months, and Tithi. So in one Mahajuga, these are the numbers you know, they used to take. The comparison of the numbers in different systems, you know, uh, I think Bhaskara and a modern Surya Siddhanta and Aryabhatta one. So the data varied little bit, not very much, but the system was slightly different. So you can see uh, this is same by all the astronomers. This also appears to be same. 
in case of Mars, it is different, you can see. Mercury also, you can, when you go to planets, the sun and moon, they are same. And Jupiter again, you find that they are little different from each one. And here, again, Venus, you find they are different. So these are the three major systems where they follow, these are the numbers. Numbers are nothing but the revolutions, you know. Everything was on that. Now, <coughs> I will explain a term which is called epoch and era, which is very important. Now, when you calculate the position, how you do? You start with a known position on a certain date, and then I say that on such and such date, now such and such date means you have to count the number of days to the desired position date. So, where you start? So, the starting date for your all calculations is called the epoch. So, they, the, the Indian astronomy, the commonly used eras, eras means like uh, Christian era, Shaka era, they are called eras, and epoch is the starting date. So, the Panchangas were primarily created with the, these eras were commonly used. One is Kali, Aryabhatta used Kali era, that means when the Kali Yuga started. Then Vikram Shaka is there is another one. Shalivahana Saka is another era, and Kollam, which was followed in Kerala. Of course, when the Islamic invasion came, then I think Hijra also became uh, another uh, era which was used by astronomers. Now, for each era, there is zero point or starting point, as I mentioned, that is Kali Po. Now, Aryabhatta once started the Kali era, counting the midnight of 17th, 18th February, 3102 BC as the epoch. And so, yeah. <coughs> yeah, actually, these dates are actually currently our dates, you know. But they didn't have the BC kind of thing. But anyway, it is 3000 years before his life. Before, yeah, it was 3102, and it says that, uh, I'll come to that, Aryabhatta wrote, uh, Arya was born when I think it was 26, uh, 26, I don't know. I'll come to that when I come to Aryabhatta. So, Aryabhatta started, uh, took this as the epoch. That means all his calculations, he started at that point. And you will see that when you calculate the technique of doing it, I will explain next. So you, it will be clear that why they needed a starting date or epoch. Starting date is fine, but why go back arbitrarily 3400 years? No, because he thought that it is the beginning of Kali. And mistakenly, many people used to think that all the planets were in, Kanya, in, in one line, that one meridian. But it was not correct. But that is, many people suspect that that was their impression. Maybe they are not exactly in one line, but very near. So they thought that that is a nice time to start with. Because if all the planets are in one line, and if you take as the starting point, it gives you some obvious advantages. The epoch of uh, Bikram Saka is 58 BC, and uh, Shalibahana era epoch was 78 AD. And epoch for Kolla Mera is 824 AD. Similarly, B Bengalis, they also use one era. And I think that is something, uh, that is uh, 593 AD is the Bengalis uh, era, the starting point. Now, this is the point that you have to do few things. One is, Determination of Tithi, the particular day, what is the Tithi and what is the Nakshatra. That means where is the moon. Nakshatra means all the Nakshatras are there. So it, you, the, that particular day's Nakshatra means where, which Nakshatra the moon is there. And Tithi is what? Tithi means what is the phase of the moon. The phase of the moon depends on the longitudinal difference of moon with the sun, isn't it? When it is zero. That means they are together, that is a new moon day, then Tithi is 1 or 0. 
So then as you go, when it goes opposite, 180 degrees, then it is the Purnima, as you know. So phase of the moon and Tichi, they are linked. And nakshatra means the position of the moon in the ecliptic. So this is a major task in Siddhantic astronomy and the rudiments are like this. Now Tithi is referred to the phase of the moon as I mentioned just now and so it refers, refers to its longitudinal distance from the sun. If sun is at 10 degree then uh, if the uh, moon is at uh, 30 degree then the difference of longitude between moon and sun is 10. And how to then use it for finding our tithi, I will give it. So, uh, Indians always use Nirayana longitude system as I mentioned. That means they had a fixed starting from point Meshadi, starting point of Rashi Aryas. The zero point in Indian Nirayana system is the starting point of Aryas, Meshadi, and there are 12 signs, each spanning 30 degrees. 12 into 30 is 360 degrees. So if you divide the ecliptic into 12 divisions, each division will be 30 degrees, that is each Rasa. The longitude in Indian system is mentioned this way. It will be N, say, 6 S. The small S indicates sign and each sign is 30 degrees. So therefore N S means N into 30 degrees. Then X degrees, so you have to add that. So N S X degree means 30N plus X degrees, Y minutes, Z seconds. And the sun moves by approximately 1 degree every day because 365 days it takes 360 degrees, so approximately 1 degree. And the moon moves every day by 13 degrees 20 minutes, you can easily find out. And thus moon's longitude increases relative to sun every day at the rate of 12 degrees and 20 minutes. Here today if it is a new moon, so tomorrow the moon will be 12 degrees 20 minutes ahead of sun and so on. And now what is a tithi? It is the longitudinal difference with the sun. If the longitudinal difference is zero, then tithi is one, pratipada or, or new moon. Next day it will be pratipada and so on. So how to find out that? Very simple. What is moon's longitude? Subtract sun's longitude and divide by 12. So that you give you the, and so therefore you will find that and the, whatever is the question that you take and add one. Suppose if you find the difference is 12, that means what is the quotient? 1. So longitudinal difference is 1 tithi and so current tithi will be another one you have to add, so it will be dithya, so on. So this is where the, the tithi calculation was done like this, difference of the two longitudes, divide by 12 and take the quotient and add 1. Nakshatra of a particular instant is the particular asterism occupied by the Nirayana moon, as I mentioned. So as each nakshatra occupies 13 degrees 12 minutes along the ecliptic, because there are 27 of them, and 360 degree if you divide by 27, you get 13 degrees 20 minutes. So how do you find out nakshatra? Starting from zero point. So what is the Nirayana longitude of the moon in degrees? Find out and divide by 13.333, which is 13 degrees 12 minutes, take the quotient and add 1. So that gives you the current nakshatra, starting from the beginning nakshatra of the moon. It's very simple calculation. And that is the way the nakshatra of that particular instant is calculated, which specifies the position of the moon in the ecliptic. Now I think the uh, main thing, another very important task as I mentioned was the uh, determination of the mean position of the sun, moon and planet. That is the job of Madhyamadhikara. First you have to, even in uh, Greek astronomy always, yes? 13 degrees 12 minutes or 13 degrees 20 minutes? Because 
Because 13 degrees 12 minutes would be 13.2. I think it's 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Yeah, I think last previous last page, I think. Last, last time you said 13 degrees. 20 yeah, 20 minutes. minutes. Yeah, I don't know why I hear it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Well, correct it later. Now you see that uh, uh, how to find out the mean position that now becomes our next task. So they took a very straightforward approach, Indian astronomers. What they did from a starting point, which you assume, which you call as the epoch, find out how many rotations or revolutions it has gone through. You know the mean uh, rotation speed per day of any heavenly body. See, if I say you know, 2 degrees per day or 30 seconds per day, so that, uh, so if you can find out the number of days from the epoch to a particular day, I say on such and such date, it means starting from the epoch, how many days have elapsed that you have to find out. And you have to multiply it by the mean motion. <coughs> so you get the mean position, very straightforward. The problem came because in Indian astronomy, the, the mixture of solar and lunar thing, you know, that created most of the complications. Otherwise, you know, it is a straightforward thing. If you know the number of days to the particular day you are interested in from the epoch and you knew the position at the epoch, then you just find out the number of days and how much movement is possible in so many days. Divide by 36 degrees because that will give you the so many full cycles and take the residue. So it has advanced that much. Is it clear? So I think that's what they did, but the only problem were there because the mixture of the, because, uh, you know, observationally they used to depend on tithi and uh, that gave the lunar day a tithi and the year was solar and number of civil days are there and mean motions were known as per civil day. So what you have to do, you have to calculate first number of civil days. That is called ahargana. Aha is a day. And ahargana means count, count of date, how many day count, that is called ahargana and that is the first thing you have to do. So at the, the starting at the epoch, the number of civil days till the desired date was found out and multiplying the mean speed of a body per day with this number gives the total angular distance divided by 360. So you then subtract the full cycles and take the residue and add to the starting longitude to get the present mean position. And total number of civil days, as I mentioned, is called ahargana, the count of days. So how do you find out ahargana? I'll show that, but before this, uh, I think this is a table which gives the position of the various rashis. And the other hand, this table gives the position of the various nakshatras. So Mesha is from 0 degree to 30 degree, then uh, Brishabha is uh, 30 degrees to 60, Mithuna from 60 to 90 and so on. And 27 nakshatras, they are like Ashini nakshatra, you start with that in Indian system. That is the Nirayana longitude, that is 0 degree to 13 degrees 20 minutes. Varani, Ashini, Varani, Kritika, Rohini. In a moment you start saying that people will immediately say it is astrology. Because, you know, I have found that whenever you utter these words, people think it is astrology. Because astrologers always say, oh, your moon is in this nakshatra, etc. They do it in a manner that this gets associated. But they have nothing to do with astrology. They are nothing but the markers in the ecliptic. And the position of each nirana longitude of each nakshatra is given. So this is the way you calculate the mean position. So if lambda prime be the longitude at the epoch, your starting day of a particular heavenly body, then the present mean longitude is given as follows. So you divide the mean speed by our gana, number of days, divide by 360, take the residue remove the integer numbers because they represent only full cycles and then add the original longitude that gives the current longitude. Very straightforward class 5 exercise, isn't it? So now I think when n is the mean speed and object and a is the other one. Now since suns and moons motions are mixed up, that 
is a little bit problematic. <coughs> and I think what they did was like this. Suppose this is the epoch at A, and number of lunisolar years elapsed, you know that. Then number of lunar months elapsed, because in Indian astronomy, months used to be always lunar months, not solar months. Because it is very easy to see a lunar month, one full moon to next full moon, or one new moon to next new moon. So it was, so therefore, the number of lunisolar years <laughs> Then you add with that number of lunar months and then number of tithi because they always worked on lunar month and tithi, not solar day as we do in the modern system. Now, of course, they are different units. So how do you make the hour gamma? So number, convert these number of lunisolar years into number of lunar months. So that way you get the total number of lunar months by converting these lunisolar years into lunar months. That can be done just by multiplying. Then this number of lunar months are lunar months only, so you can directly add. So it's the same unit. And this is the number of tithis. Now what they used to do, this total number of lunar months, they used to convert into tithis just by multiplying by 30. So therefore, you get up to this total number of tithis and add this number of tithis, so it is the same unit now. So total number of tithis you get. And then you know how much, uh, how many civil days uh, will be there that you can get by dividing this by the, uh, the that number which relates num tithi with this civil day. That is there you, know, you can easily find out. So therefore the basically the principle is you will see on such and such year, on such and such month and such and such tithi what is the position. And to do that, you first convert this into lunar months. Lunar months are already there, you add. Then again, you convert all these lunar months into tithi, add the tithi, you get everything in tithi, then convert everything into civil days. And this total number of civil days is called Ahakana. If we had the system uh, to, to work with only civil days and solar system, solar astronomy, all these complications should not have been necessary, but we always depend on the lunar month and lunar tithis and then solar year. That's how, why the whole thing conversion is done this way. Is it clear? That is the basic scheme. Now actual calculations you do, that is different, but the basic scheme or philosophy under the whole thing was this, to find out the mean position. Okay? So, the mean motion of different objects in the heaven in Siddhantic astronomy, what various uh, people, uh, astronomers did, like say, per day motion of sun was this much by Aryabhartyam, in Surya Siddhanta it was this much, in modern value is this much. So, you can see that uh, how with naked eye astronomy, so amazing accuracies they could achieve, you know, could believe. Moon, of course, is much faster, 13 degree 10 minute, 34.87759 seconds. It is 13 degrees, 10 minutes, 34.5202 seconds. And modern value is 34.9. So you can see that Aryabhartyam is much nearer to modern value, which is the accurate value. So these are the, then they also had the, uh, the perigee motion, Venus perigee motion, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. The, in case of Mercury and Venus, since they are inner planets, so inner planets will never go around completely, isn't it? So they work with the perigee motion. It's a little bit complicated, but I think you can recognize that fact. But they are not uh, planets which go around the earth continuously, they don't. You have seen it is always near the sun going this way, that way. Now Manda and Sigra corrections are some scars I mentioned. After the mean positions are determined, the above corrections are applied to get the true position, actual position. In the cases of sun and mean, moon only Manda correction was there because in, case, in that case, 
the changeover from heliocentric to geocentric did not create any problem. But the other planets uh, which are going round the sun and you are observing from moon which, uh, earth which is also going round the earth, you needed the corrections. And that's why the Sigra corrections or Sigra samskaras were necessary for planets. You needed both Manda and Sigra. In case of sun and moon, you needed only. So here, <laughs> uh, things become more complicated and I don't think that we need to go uh, to this converting the system from this. Those who are interested, the whole detailed thing, how it is done, the theory behind it, you will find in the book. It's primarily kinematics and uh, little involved, not much, but those who are interested can always find that how it is done. But the basic idea is this, that these corrections are to find out the true position. Since they are not really moving with uh, constant speed, varying speed, so correction is needed for that. Another is changeover from the reference frame from earth to sun, you know, that also you need some corrections. Now I think, um, I think you will find in the book that you know, while doing these corrections, they have to have the epicycles or cycles. You know. So, so there, uh, all these things, you know, uh, another correction was necessary. It was that which was relatively minor, which was called Bhujantara correction for the planet. And that Bhujantara correction they did because of the eccentricity of the orbit of the earth. Another correction was needed. And that is called Bhujantara correction, which was minor or small, but still they did it in their astronomers. And uh, your uh, Lavna is one thing which you have heard, and you should know just for the sake of uh, knowledge, but it has no scientific significance. Lavna is the time when, or the nakshatra, when the moon rises. You know, it is used mostly in astrology. It has no astronomical significance. Now I think let us go to some of the important astronomers. It is very important, we must discuss that. The first one obviously is Aryabhatta I. <coughs> he was born in 476 AD at Kusumapura, today's Patna, and consisted of four sections, his Aryabhatta. The four sections are Gitika, Ganita, Kalakriya and Gola. He also started two schools. In one, in one the civil day used to be from midnight to midnight, just like our current international system. And that is called Ardharatrika system. And the other was one civil day was counted from sunrise to sunrise. That is the <coughs> Odayaka system from Udaya, Surya Udaya. So these are both the systems were developed by Aryabhatta and calculations will differ a little bit obviously because count of day etc. are different. And he devised an alphanumeric system which is very interesting where a word or letter represented a number. I will come a little bit of that, it is very interesting and it is nothing but a compression technology. They will give a slope but it is a mathematical formula or mathematical quantity. That way they used to remember. Now you see, amazing thing is that whole book, Aryabhatya, which had Gitika, Ganita, Kalakriya, Gola, everything, description of the universe, calculation of the Madhama Adhikara, mean position, calculation of the exact correct position, then various Tithi calculation, Kalakriya, all those things, plus direction, eclipse finding, all those things, Total number of horses were only 121. 13 were in uh, Gitika, 33 were in Gunita, 25 in Kalakriya, 50 in Gola. And his Madhyamadhikara, which I was explaining, that means finding out the mean position, he used only 10 horses. That was, can you imagine that the whole information, mathematical information, he compressed into only 10 horses. So the alphabetical representation of numbers, you know, what Aryabhatta and 
that system followed. Like say, A was one, I was hundred, U was ten thousand, and so on. And K A was one, like that. So this system was improved by Kerala astronomers, and it was called Kottapaya the system. A good example given by Sankaracharya is that this verse in Sanskrit, Gopi Bhaya Madhubrata Asmi Dadhi, something, you know. And this really means value of pi up to 30 decimal places. Using that system, Kattapaya, this system. You know. so those who are interested, you can go to uh, Sankaracharya's text and you can see how it happened. That actually the value of pi up to 30 decimal place, places is represented by this one line of sloka using that alphanumeric system. I cannot. I am not an expert in that. <laughs> huh? Yeah, it is a Sanskrit slow. Gopi Bhaya Madhubrata speaks. In general, by and large, they used to also have a meaning. That's why you could remember, it is not just some alphabets. So that is the credit, you know, how it is possible to create a verse, but which actually also had a lot of mathematical formula contained in. Aryabhatya, that's why Aryabhatyan text is extremely difficult for the subsequent astronomers, not very happy at all. Aryabhatya one also found out, yeah? Is it the first one to use decimal, this is like decimal system, no, in this? No. No. You see, a decimal system was there by that time. Aryabhatya found the value of pi as 3.1415, four decimal places. And Greeks always use the value of pi as 22 by 7 for a very long time. And you know, the modern mathematicians are amazed because to find the value of pi up to four decimal places required, inscribe a regular polygon with 768 sides in a circle. Then only you will be able to. How it was done? You draw a circle and inscribe a regular polygon, count the number or the length of the each side, add and divide by the radius, you get the value of pi. To get the value up to four decimal places, it was necessary to inscribe a regular polygon with 768 sides. It's not a very easy task. You know. So this is the most accurate value in ancient time as used by Aryabhatta in the fifth century AD. Aryabhatta one was aware of the fact that the planets appeared luminous because of reflected sunlight. And he was the first to announce the daily rotation of the earth. And he received, of course, many abuses. And he, later you will see that he calculated the rotation period, sidereal rotation of the earth, as 23 hours, 56 minutes, 4.1 seconds, which is very accurate when compared with the modern value, 23 hours, 56 minutes, 4.091 seconds. So you imagine their brilliance by naked eye observations, you, and they didn't have clock, etc. also, you know. So finding out the values quantitatively up to this is really something amazing, you know, unbelievable in my opinion. He also was very emphatic that the eclipses were not caused by Rahu, but by the moon and the shadow of the earth. And he received lots of abuses, not only by other astronomers of the later period, by even those who followed his schools and like his disciples. The, luckily, we didn't have the system of burning somebody alive. Perhaps he could have been, uh, he could have had the same faith like Giordano Bruno, the way, you know, his revolutionary, revolutionary ideas were rejected by the subsequent astronomers for a very long time. So Aryabhatta one, in my opinion, stands uh, much higher compared to many others. They are also brilliant, like Varahamihir. Varahamihir used very abusive language about Aryabhatta one. Then uh, Brahmagupta, Bhaskara, they are all brilliant uh, astronomers, but nobody can match the merit of Aryabhatta one, in my opinion. Now another thing is, as I mentioned, precision of the equinox. Ayana Chalana and the zero precision year. We discussed little bit, you know that uh, Earth 
not only spins about its axis, but the axis of spin also slowly precesses because of which our uh, vernal equinoctical point slowly shifts towards west in the starry background. And uh, in the ancient time, it was, uh, it is not found and uh, only Bhaskaracharya realized earlier people observed that, but they thought that to be a motion of the starry background, not of the planets or anything. So, but only Bhaskaracharya first realized that it is a shifting of the equinoctical intersection point. And since the Indian astronomers used a Nirayana system, on the Western system, we always start from that vernal equinoctical point, but here we start from Meshadi. So, I think uh, this, uh, it was necessary uh, to uh, take into calculation of this shift, how much it has shifted from Meshadi to the current vernal equinoctical point and then the rest. So, this variation, this difference caused by the precision was called Ayanamsa. That is the angular distance of the vernal equinoctical point at present with the Meshadi, that is the starting point of the uh, 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 sign areas. And the first definitive mention was by Vishnu Chandra and the 5th century AD of that, but a much clearer statement came from Munjal around 932 AD and his estimate of the rate was 59.9 seconds of hour per year, whereas the Greek astronomy used it at 36 seconds, but 59.9 is much nearer the correct value, about I think 56 seconds per hour the actual value. So, the year when the vernal equinox coincided with Meshadi or which is called the zero precision year, Indian various astronomers considered the following as the zero precision year. Like Munjal took 449 Saka year as the zero precision year. Modern Surya Siddhanta takes 421 Saka year as the zero precision year. Then Karana Kuntala, Graha Lagava, Second Arya Siddhanta and Damodara, they all have different uh, Saka year as the zero precision year in their calculations. Actually, that's why there are so much of errors and variations and uh, later time, Meghna Saha was very emphatic that, you know, some major uh, correction or major work is needed to take care of that. Now, when we come to the late Siddhantic period, uh, by the time of Bhaskaracharya, most of the important developments were done and during the later Siddhantic and medieval period, no major original development took place in Indian astronomical system. Only in Kerala, some new concepts evolved and the innovative ideas are proposed by astronomers there. Now, actually after the Islamic invasion in the 13th century AD, the northern and western India was <coughs> somewhat disturbed. And again, in, even then there were Nadir Shah, Taimur Lam, and their invasion created havoc temporarily. Again, when Mughals came, it was stabilized. Like that it happened. The uh, considerable interaction with the West Asian scholar took place, of course, in that time. So, influence, there was some positive influence. But uh, Indian astronomy texts were translated into foreign languages, as I mentioned, and I will discuss it in much more details in tomorrow, when I discuss the medieval period. And Pancha Siddhantika was also translated into Chinese by Chu Tan Sita in 718 AD and its name was Chiu Chi Li. After this, Indian astronomical knowledge made a substantial um, influence on Chinese astronomy. More or less during the same period, Brahma Gupta's Brahma Sputa Siddhanta was translated into Arabic and that called Sin Hind, you know, at the time of Caliph Al-Masur of Baghdad and the text was known as Aziz Al-Sin Hind. Al Kabir, and subsequently uh, Aryabhatya was also translated into Arabic by Abul Hasan, and the text was called Azharvads. And Brahmagupta's Khandakhadaka was also translated. Al Biruni, you know, was a very important person and great scholar who visited India and wrote a lot about Indian science and astronomy. He was here for 14 years. And uh, he knew, he was an exponent in many languages, including Sanskrit. 
So he not only translated uh, Indian Sanskrit text into Arabic, but also Arabic or Persian text into Sanskrit. That also he did. And he was a great admirer of Brahmagupta. In his opinion, he was truly an outstanding astronomer. And uh, he translated Brahmo Siddhanta and Khanda Khaddaka. And his famous book, Kitab Taikik Ma El Hind, Bil, oh my God, goes quite long. It's better not to attempt. <laughs> so it means verification of what is said about India, which is accepted or rejected by reason. That is the name of the book. So it is something like thesis title in chemistry department. <laughs> <laughs> Comprehensive information on India is also found in his other book, Tariq Al Hind. And you know, nowadays you can read Al Biruni's India. There is a good book in English which is available. You can read about Al Biruni's whole writing <coughs> on India. It's very interesting. As mentioned earlier, it is commonly acknowledged that in the post Bhaskara II, late Siddhantic period, there was a gradual decline in Indian mathematics and astronomy. However, in the southern part of the country, which was less affected, work continued. And actually in Kerala, they developed an astronomy which was same as Tycho Bahas, Tycho, Tycho Bahas system. That means Tycho Bahas system was the earth is stationary, sun is going around the earth, and all other planets are moving around the sun. Same kind of, because it is, you know, you find, if you study a little bit, kinematically, the observation will be same whether it is the real heliocentric system or geocentric system or the Tycho Bahas or Kerala system. So Kerala astronomy also evolved a system where sun goes around the earth and all other planets go around the sun. And I think, I am not sure I couldn't find, but it is said that uh, uh, there were hints of heliocentricity in many of the works they did. And data was very clear because <coughs> if you see the epicycle sizes which are nothing but the orbital radius, their ratios are very similar to the, uh, the astronomical units that means uh, which, we, which we use for telling the radius of the orbit of various planets. In the book you will find the whole thing. Uh, but still the whole thing escaped their mind. I think I was being asked by Professor Bhattacharya that how come this happened that they never really, because they are so busy with accurate determination of the position, the physics behind the whole thing perhaps they were, uh, they missed the point. Secondly, the reason why the Aryabhatta's rotating arc or these things were Aristarchus's heliocentric system or not. Because the laws of physics were not ready for people to accept. <coughs> inertia, the first law of inertia, until and unless you have first law of motion, you cannot accept a moving earth. Everybody will say that if it is moving, if I drop a stone, why not the stone falls far behind? So it is only when the concept of inertia, first law of inertia by Galileo and Descartes came, it was not possible for, for people to accept a moving earth or a rotating arc. So I think uh, I'll uh, stop here. If you have a few questions, I can discuss. And tomorrow we'll start the medieval period, and we'll end that. And final day will be the story of how interestingly interesting, and some of them are very pathetic. Also, you will see they are known as tragedies in astronomy. You will see that, and some discussion on the originality and antiquity of Indian system. So, any question on today's topic? So, I'm supposed to compare <coughs> questions? Yeah. So, if you use a software to see that, I'm still intrigued whether 3100 to see. Okay, just it's a moment. Something, something, uh, which, which period do you want to go? Yes, there are zero points that are given to me. Oh. Must be something happening. Uh, oh, that's <laughs> No, no, I think. Yeah, I think uh, it has been uh, suspected that they felt that something like that happened, but really it didn't happen that because you are expecting to get all the planets at one point, isn't it? Yeah, I don't think it happened that way. One theory is that it's the Mahabharata or something. Like that. 
Uh, you said uh, your date was minus. Minus Yeah. Minus three one zero seven zero two zero two three one zero two zero two and February February seventeenth. We have to go to midnight. Hours 12, zero, 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 it should be zero. No, 17, zero, 18, zero. Hey, you can leave it. Hmm. Okay. Ready? <laughs> Location, of course, uh, you can say 80 degree, our uh, uh, longitude is 80 degree east, isn't it? Yeah. 80 degree east, 80 degree east, and 23 degrees 45, approximately the latitude, north. Huh? Delhi, Delhi is what is? It is with 24? No, 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 want. Uh, 26. 26? Okay, let us see. You know, it should not change. With latitude, the meridian of the thing should not affect. Yeah. So, I think, but only thing, of course, then sun also has to be there. So, we have to see where the sun is. February means it will be after the winter solstice. So, let us wait. This software cricket is really wonderful, you know. It gives the feeling, yes, we are in darkness. <laughs> it looks one planet we saw, with the green one, that's the planet. It has been checked, they found it is not correct. Oh, this is the Saturn, but they are not very different. You can see, you can see, this is Saturn, this is, I don't know, another one, not, Mar uh, this is Mars. Mars and Sun very near, Moon is also very near, and Jupiter also is very near. So I think there is a point. <coughs> you can see only a few degrees. Four of them. I think Jupiter, the Moon, and Mars. then one more, one more. What is that? The blue. Yeah. So Electra. No, that's at least four I could see. Then the blue is coming up. Electra. This is Jupiter and blue is something. Hmm. <coughs> now modern time means it will be some Uranus, Neptune, everything can be there. And this is Sun and this is Mars. So you can see there are one, two, three, four, five, a moon, and then Saturn. This. So I think there is a point, they are very near. They are not exactly in one line, they are very near. So he's there is some, some merit in it, though it is not exactly correct. That within few degrees, all the planets were together at that time. Okay, other questions? Okay, I have one question. Yeah. So, Aryabhatiya gave the name Aryabhatiya himself or somebody else? But normally, they don't give the name on them, uh, after themselves. Was the book written, his uh, name was Aryabhatiya? I don't know his father's name. Otherwise, I could say that. Actually, Bhatta means uh, Arya Bhatta. It is still not known that whether he is from south or he actually was. He worked in Kusumpura, but since Arya Bhatta's school was very ardently followed in the south, not in the north, so many think that actually he was from south. Not there is much. A region called Oshmako. Oshmako is associated with Arya, and Oshmako is supposed to be somewhere in the south. No, even people suspect Aryabhatta also from the south because in south only his whole Paksha was followed strictly. But he worked in Kusumpura and Kusumpura is uh, considered to be uh, uh, Patna because Patali is a flower, you know, trumpet flower. 
Okay, any other questions? So if not, uh, let's thank Professor Boyce again. Thank you.